Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, the first uh, keynote uh, speaker. We have two excellent uh, speakers providing different perspectives. The first keynote address will be given by Kalpana Balakrishnan, who is director of the Sri Ramachandra Institute for Higher Education and Research at the <coughs> University in uh, India. And I'm going to give you the slide. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am delighted and honored to be here today. My grateful thanks to BERT and all the organizers of ISE, and in particular to the numerous members of ISE. I think many members who received the awards talked about numerous collaborators. I think I couldn't dare to come up and stand before you without the assistance and the wonderful support of numerous collaborators, members of ISE and outside. Uh, and share this experience of our journey in India to advance the cause of managing air pollution. It is with much humility that I choose to present this topic. As you can recognize, India is a very big country with lots of great things happening and lots of big challenges. And I couldn't possibly do justice to all of it in half an hour, but I'll try my best. Uh, air pollution is one of the greatest killers of our age. And perhaps nowhere is this a greater everyday reality than in India. Millions of young girls, young women, children, and other members of the family in rural homes are exposed to household air pollution from the use of solid biomass fuels for essential everyday activities such as cooking. At the same time, many of our cities, large and many, many small cities, are reeling from exposures attributable to coal use, vehicles, agricultural waste burning, brick kilns, and a myriad of other local sources. Unfortunately, these airs and spaces, as we want to view them, are viewed as being discrete entities, not just for regulation, but even within the scheme of health effects research. And there is now an increasing body of evidence to show that such compartmentalization is not helpful. And the goal should be really to create a framework where we can coherently address all these sources to create seamless breathing spaces. The biggest challenge for this is one of scale. In 2017, the annual population weighted mean exposure to ambient PM2.5 was estimated to be nearly 90 micrograms per meter cube. Exposures in most states and for nearly 75% of India's population was in excess of the Indian national standard of an annual mean of 40 micrograms per meter cube. Considerable heterogeneity across states with exposures at New Delhi that most people uh, would be familiar here with at nearly 210 micrograms per meter cube when compared to less than 20 micrograms per meter cube in the southern state of Kerala. The proportion of population using solid fuels is estimated to be at 55% with the highest prevalence in the state of Bihar some 10 to 40 times greater than in the states of Goa and the southern states of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. I would like to remind you, it's very sobering indeed to remind ourselves, that the denominator for all these calculations is the population of India at 1.36 billion. So if you're looking at 55% of the population using household fuels, and even if this number were to plummet dramatically, and even if only 10% or 20% of the population would be using biomass fuels, this would still be a huge challenge for us to deal with for many years to come. And on a lighter note, I want to um, uh, recall that editor uh, Mustafa mentioned that she needed to show a map of Africa to let people know what a diverse group of countries they are. I'm showing this map of India. We are one country, all right. But with 29 states, seven union territories, many of which are as large as countries with their respective state administrations at varying levels of development and 22 official languages. Not an easy problem to solve. I'm thinking that if somebody came up to me and said, Akuna Matata, 
There is a greater chance I will understand that than the 20 languages that I don't speak. So not an easy challenge for uh, you know, risk communication. Um, at this scale of exposure, it is not surprising that the burden is large. 1.2 million deaths were attributable to air pollution in 2017. The contributions from ambient and household air pollution, as you can see, nearly equal. And in fact, the balance may need to be reversed if you consider the contribution of all household sources and not just household air pollution associated with exposures in and around the home when compared to ambient air pollution. The total burden is also not different across the more developed states or the high SDI states when compared to the less developed states. Again, emphasizing the need to look at ambient and household sources jointly. Air pollution is indeed the new tobacco for us and everywhere in the world. We waged a war some 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and the battle for NCDs and tobacco is far from being finished. In many ways, we have to gather an army similar in scale to combat the insults of air pollution and many other previously unsolved risk factors in India and elsewhere perhaps. There is a long history of air quality actions in India since enacting the original Air Act in 1981 to the formulation of the newest and the most recent National Clean Air Program in 2018. There is now evidence of health gains, economic gains, and most importantly, gains from programs that are not rolled out as air pollution initiatives. Risk management, despite this, has been quite difficult. So I would like to provide in the next few minutes a very high level overview of what has been accomplished and much has been accomplished thanks to the contribution of many IAC members and perhaps uh, propose a new paradigm that a collaborative group of us are considering to achieve the fastest gains for health. The journey thus far has been quite challenging, but I think we have made a lot of progress in understanding and more importantly, accepting the growing pool of evidence on health effects, which has been evolving. I think it started out with some unhealthy levels of skepticism, especially amongst the decision makers, especially on the burden numbers, and perhaps now stands as a healthy criticism of some real uncertainties. But this, thanks to the collective engagement of the global and the national pool of GBD collaborators, many of whom are present in this room, the WHO, and numerous members of ISPE. The points highlighted in red have had the most amount of trouble gaining uniform acceptance among stakeholders, including researchers, that the burden could be as high as 1.2 million, that even this is likely an underestimate, that impacts of household air pollution and household sources are not limited to women or to rural populations, that the burden from household and ambient air pollution can be equal in many, many states, large states, and that the burden is greater than attributable to tobacco, malaria, and many other issues that have been traditionally thought to be the biggest public health risks in India. I heard Dr. Andy Haynes say that skepticism, you know, is not such a bad thing, as long as it doesn't translate into denial. Um, and it is um, actually quite heartening to say that, you know, despite this uncertainty and despite the skepticism, the momentum on actions in India is worth taking a note of. Earlier this year, the National Clean Air Program was officially launched. As you can see from air quality monitoring networks to national emission inventories to health impact studies, capacity building, it has every element that you would, be, you would expect to be included in a clean air program. It has identified some 102 non-attainment cities where efforts are to be intensified on implementation of sectoral controls. Granted that the National Free Air Program is heavily focused on cities and non-attainment cities, but the key sectoral controls address targets for all major sources, including transport with a special emphasis on electric mobility, power with a special emphasis on phasing out coal, agricultural waste burning, and biomass fuels. And evidence continues to be reported on health gains, such as, for example, from leapfrogging 
from the BS4 or the pilot stage 4 to the uh, pilot stage 6 comparable to the Euro 6 standards for vehicular emissions. Productivity gains from uh, cleaner technologies uh, such as the use of zigzag brick kilns, again a major source of air pollution, and most recently from the happy cedar based systems to ag address agricultural burning that are some 20% more profitable than burn systems, nearly eliminate particulate emissions from burning and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from on-farm activities by about 78%. What is unique is the reference to these kinds of technologies is actually mandated in some cases or at least available as guidance for people to adopt at scale. And in many cases, the, the brick kilns, for example, it, you know, all brick kilns in the country are required to transition to these cleaner technologies by a stipulated time frame. But what is relatively new in our scheme of thinking is prioritizing ambient sources on the basis of health impacts and the overwhelming contributions from the household cook fuels. To date, there have been seven published studies that model the proportion of ambient PM 2.5 that is attributable to household sources, household cooking in particular, and estimate the contribution from household sources to be anywhere between 22 to 52 percent, and significantly higher than the contribution from transportation, power plants, and industries. Needless to say, all these studies therefore estimate a much larger health burden attributable to residential energy. Mitigating household sources are thus the lowest hanging fruit for air quality actions on household air pollution and ambient air pollution. Shown here is a wonderful piece of work carried out by Dr. Sardik Day and his colleagues at IIT Delhi that shows that if PM 2.5 from all household emissions are completely mitigated, the national annual population weighted exposure which stood at some 55 to 65 for the base year that they uh, use for calculation would be around 38 micrograms per meter cube within the national ambient air quality standard with an estimated 585 million people living in districts that meet the national standard. The authors conclude that the Indian National Ambient Air Quality Standard is completely achievable by mitigating emissions from household co-fuels. As regards mitigating the direct exposures from cooking, the conventional wisdom for addressing household air pollution has been to take what is available readily and locally, wood, crop waste and dung, and use them in more uh, efficient cookstuffs. Now, numerous studies uh, that have been uh, targeted and improved by mass cookstuffs have thus far proved that they are not in resonance with people's requirements. They continue to be stacked with traditional three uh, stone fires and do not meet the health-based guidelines stipulated by the WHO. The new paradigm, therefore, has to be making the clean available over making the available clean. The LPG uh, as a solution for household air pollution has often been discounted by the development community for being non-renewable. Uh, but as it is an unavoidable product of oil and natural gas uh, production and oil refining, a global LPG surplus actually exists. And further yet, the environmental footprint of LPG is negligible compared with biomass and other fuels because of its very efficient and complete combustion and its sustained performance and field use over time. LPG emits negligible amounts of black carbon and other short-lived pollutants that contribute to global warming. And a recent analysis by IASA concludes that from switching from wood to gas for cooking is really not a climate problem. In India, the national fuel wood displaced due to the increased LPG access between 2001 and 2011 was approximately 7.2 million tons. This is estimated to have resulted in a net uh, emissions reduction of nearly uh, 6.73 metric tons of carbon dioxide uh, emissions. In fact, some of the surplus LPG is rented or flared at oil and gas production sites, wasting this valuable fuel resource and spewing carbon back into the atmosphere. Using it for clean cooking would make a lot more sense. If anyone wants to argue on climate grounds with a woman cooking with solid fuels, I suggest that we spend a week in a rural kitchen, spend three to five hours collecting fuel, 
and try and cook three meals every day and still see if you can still bring yourself to make this argument with her. <laughs> Again, Dr. Mustafa made this case for this extraordinary energy dilemma in LMICs. Communities just want to lead their everyday lives with enough energy to lead a life of dignity. Indeed, filling this community aspiration to cook with clean fuels is the cornerstone for the runaway success of the Prime Minister's LPG program, termed as the Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana. And interestingly, it was not rolled out as an air pollution initiative. The focus of the program was all about fulfilling community aspirations with social investments on infrastructure required to address the barrier, the first barriers, access and availability for adoption of clean fuels. The program has many unique features. It is women-centric, enabling her to first obtain a licensed connection since all LPG supply in India is regulated centrally through public sector oil marketing companies. Enables financial inclusion because she can't get a gas connection and she can only get a connection if she has a unique identity card tagged to her own bank account and has explicit fiscal resources for the program implementation. It has been envisioned at an unprecedented scale and what's even more unbelievable is that it has been ahead of the stated annual target every single year for the last five years. If you travel to India and get down at the airport, it is hard to miss the billboards carrying the awareness and advocacy messaging with our Prime Minister himself at the helm of it. Some 80 million households have been enabled with access to LPG in just a matter of four years. The first and the most critical barrier for transitioning to clean fuels. And this happened in states, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, all these states struggling from the dual incels of ambient and household air pollution. Of course, sustained use is the next barrier. We recognize that as people transition into clean and energy, such as LPG, they continue to use the old traditional fuels, and uh, you know, stacking really does not help with achieving health-relevant exposure reductions, but it's really the first essential barrier to be crossed. And because sustained use is contingent upon crossing the economic barrier, to cross the affordability barrier, we can't possibly recommend providing free LPG all the time to everybody that needs it. And therefore, we have been engaging in some strategic epidemiology on how best to prioritize clean energy investments by examining health effects on the most vulnerable groups and exposure windows. Recently published results from the first cohort studies establishing the exposure response on pregnant women for birth weight estimate a nearly 82 gram decrease in birth rate uh, <coughs> associated with biomass use when compared to using LPG use. And in India, with an estimated national low birth prevalence of about 18%, with some states at about 25%, this really is a big deal. And efforts are now on to strengthen this evidence through the multi-country LPG trial or the HAPEN um, trial. Uh, across four countries that include India, and that is going to examine impacts on birth weight, child pneumonia, child growth, and blood pressure in older women as primary outcomes. All this progress is great, uh, but we all recognize that despite all of this, you know, goodness that's that out there in terms of programs, you know, on the ground, it's not as though we've cleaned up all our cities or cleaned up all our villages. Risk management for air pollution is proving very, very difficult. So, the biggest barrier perhaps is not more evidence, but really capacities for agents of change. Of course we need the long-term mortality studies. Of course we need to refine the exposure response relationships. Of course we need source-specific information. All this would be great, but what is really needed now is the initiation of a healthy dialogue between those who create this evidence, who create this information, and those who distribute it and the decision makers. So many of us, as part of the Clean uh, Air, Collaborative Clean Air Policy Center, a partnership between UC Berkeley, Cherry, our university, IIT Delhi, and Urban Emissions, are now trying to think of a new paradigm. Where could we start for the most efficient near-term results? 
so that this risk communication package can be packaged differently and we can start this dialogue with the, uh, with the decision makers. And we propose a new paradigm to go beyond cities. The National Clean Air Program is already doing quite a bit for cities and they are going to go ahead with monitoring and evaluation. But we need a different paradigm to go beyond cities and focus on villages. And to frame this paradigm, we draw upon the recommendations put forth in a joint statement issued by the five leading national academies of science. The collective wisdom of all the members of these academies recommend that we need to focus on intersectoral solutions. Solutions with overarching benefits that capture inequities for vulnerable populations and co-benefits amongst multiple policy instruments. And finally, have a mechanism to share the success stories and attract development funding. We think all of this can be accomplished by sharpening our focus on villages for air quality actions in India, given the current state of evidence about the importance of household sources and the implementation framework that is in place to make a difference with clean energy access. And indeed, there is an unprecedented opportunity to piggyback on an existing scaffold for coordinated actions. And this is contained in what is now known as the Rashtriya Gram Swaraj Abhiyan, literally means a campaign to empower village autonomy. More than 200,000 village panchayats or local governments have been co-opted across all states and union territories with a fiscal allocation of nearly a billion Indian rupees to achieve sustainable development goals. It draws upon seven fla flagship programs shown uh, in detail and every single one of these programs has something in it for air pollution. The Sahaj Bijli Yojana or Saubhagya that will provide 100% electrification uh, and eliminate dependence on kerosene lighting, something recommended by the WHO. The PMUY that I described already that is now contemplating further subsidies to support sustained use among the poorest districts. The Ujala that speaks to promote energy efficiency. The Jan Dhan uh, Yojana that seeks to improve financial security through a combination of insurance and loans. And finally, most importantly, a focus on women and children through Mission in the Dhanush or Mission Rainbow that seeks to provide universal vaccination and maternal and child health services to assess impacts on child development and growth. Um, I think Dr. Howard, who in one of his presentations mentioned that in India there are at least 16 to 20 ministries in charge of air pollution and that's why we can't seem to uh, you know, move the ball. Uh, you know, if all these ministries, none of these programs have the air pollution narrative on the front, but if we could add this air pollution narrative into these existing programs for villages, there is 10 of the ministries already on board already. And in addition, if we could add longitudinal air pollution monitoring, whether uh, you know, as the air pollution goes down inside households or outside the communities and villages, and we now have tremendous capacities to conduct these monitorings at scale, as well as the means to capture inequities for young girls and women associated with time poverty in collecting uh, the fuels, then this could provide unprecedented fertile grounds to make a case for mitigating household sources. And finally, I think it is important to bear in mind that we can't go into uh, rural communities in a piecemeal way and expect gains for health in the presence of other environmental health risks. While it is difficult to address all possible environmental health risks, I think integration with water, um, you know, sanitation and hygiene could be especially useful and very, very uh, critical. Um, in this EHP commentary uh, by two lines of uh, randomized control trials in wash and household air pollution, uh, they argue that there are compelling reasons to overcome the artificial and unproductive segregation of household air pollution and wash in villages. Both these programs face similar challenges in designing, implementing and securing the sustained use of scalable interventions, including clean fuels and water. We could thus perhaps make an even greater case for developmental investments by starting and thinking that the A in WASH stands for air pollution. So in conclusion, I would like to say that focusing on accountability studies on air pollution is really the need of the day. 
and focusing on accountability studies on rural populations for air pollution mitigation may serve as a tipping point to advance the case of all air quality actions at scale and in the near term in India. You see these pictures of women and old people biking in villages? It's possible in Utrecht and in villages in India, but not in the cities of India. Uh, India really lives in its villages. We really need to be looking at lessons learned from the rural initiatives uh, that can provide the required momentum to advance not only the goals of sustainable development in the long term in India, but elsewhere in low and uh, middle income uh, countries. So uh, I would like to uh, recap what um, Annette said in, um, yesterday in, uh, in, uh, in her talk, quoting John Goldsmith. Some smart, well done strategic epidemiological studies of what India needs. We should not lose the beauty of simplicity by distancing ourselves from the people by merely telling them what's wrong and who's responsible for polluting their environment with their environment, but by telling them what works and what could work. The very small community of environmental epidemiologists in India and my own uh, team of very dedicated researchers, many of whom uh, who are there in the audience, would gratefully welcome the assistance of the ISEE. And I think Ruth said that ISEE supports the lone zebra. Well, we are not quite alone, but we are really a small, a small, uh, you know, pack of people trying to meander through this jungle of the numerous considerations that is really required for air quality actions. So we would be very grateful to receive this assistance, this collaboration, and making a difference really for our future should not be a matter of choice. So thank you again, ISEE, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of my entire research team, and all the numerous collaborators, one too many to name. I really apologize for not being able to name all of them, but I am really hoping that we will be able to welcome you all to a future meeting in India, an ISE meeting in India, and we are hoping by then we will get our airs, waters, and spaces right. So we will have all these places looking like this to welcome you in a few years. So hope to see you in India soon. Thank you again. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation not only focusing on problems, but also uh, addressing the way forward. And uh, I, I like the optimistic part of your uh, talk as well. And also thank you for reminding us that Utrecht is more like an Indian village than an Indian city. <laughs>